Welcome to NTD News, I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at today's top stories. The nation's largest fuel pipeline is back up and running, but how long will it take for the supply chain to get back to normal? Arizona's Attorney General urges President Joe Biden to remove Kamala Harris as borders are and find someone else. He says her performance is abysmal. The Pentagon throwing its support behind Israel during its conflict with Palestinians. But what do Trump and his former administration officials have to say about Biden over the Hamas attacks? And people got together at Times Square to show support for Israel and condemn the attacks on the Jewish state. Colonial Pipeline is back up and running, but it says it'll take several days before the delivery supply chain returns to normal. NTD's Jessica Beatty has the story. Colonial Pipeline restarted the nation's largest fuel pipeline network Wednesday afternoon, but it'll take days to get back to normal. This gas station in North Carolina ran out of gas Tuesday. It just got a new delivery. We got 4,000 gallons and it'll be gone in about an hour. (laughs) Tracking firm Gas Buddy said nearly 60% of gas stations in Metro Atlanta were without gas Wednesday. This driver's filling up so he can get to work. Clearly, I guess this ransomware attack on the, on the Colonial Pipeline has made gas impossible to get in Atlanta right now. And a similar scene in Virginia. This driver says he's not even panic buying. I've just been getting a little low for the last couple days and I knew I should have filled up a week ago. I was kind of overdue anyway. And then all this starts going on and it's like the toilet paper fiasco all over again. <laughs> now here's the thing, this is a loner. I used to have a hybrid, it's in the, in the shop. If it was a hybrid, I'd be set. I wouldn't worry. But unfortunately, I'm in this situation, and I've never seen anything like this, have you? The FBI says a group called DarkSide is responsible for last week's cyber attack. It disabled some internal computer systems and demanded a ransom to release them. The hackers didn't take control of pipeline operations, but Colonial shut it down to contain the damage. And President Biden signed an executive order Wednesday that he says will improve the nation's cybersecurity. It seeks to better equip federal agencies with cybersecurity tools. It also encourages the private sector, which operates much of the nation's critical infrastructure, to improve its own cybersecurity standards. Under the new order, a system will be enabled on federal networks to continually monitor and respond to cyber threats. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. As the situation continues to get worse at the southern border, Republican leaders hammer the Biden administration for creating the crisis and failing to take meaningful action to stop it. Republican leaders are escalating calls for the Biden administration to take the border crisis more seriously. Florida Senator Rick Scott says President Joe Biden's policies invited a surge of immigrants. There is a man-made crisis on our border, and it's 100 percent caused by one person, Joe Biden. We know Biden's open borders and amnesty policies have created this crisis. Just look at the numbers. Customs and Border Protection says illegal attempts at border crossing jumped in April to 178,000, a 21-year high, and deportations dropped. Arizona Attorney General Mark Burnovich wrote a letter to Biden Wednesday about the border crisis. He asked Biden to replace Kamala Harris as the border czar. He says he was initially encouraged that the vice president would lead the effort at the border, and he invited her to tour the border with him, but never got a response from her or anyone in the administration. Brnovich says Harris's lack of interest in the border is a slap in the face to the people of Arizona and that her performance as border czar is abysmal. Minority leader Kevin McCarthy says he told Biden about some of what he's seen at the border. If America was able to watch those young girls, one even 11 months old, that had a rancher not found them, would they even be alive today? The sad part is, that's not the only story like that. It's day in and day out. He says Republicans want to work with the president to address the crisis. Harris says she will address the root causes of illegal immigration, such as poverty, climate, and violence. Brnovich says that the policy changes need to happen now. He writes, Mr. President, we cannot afford another day, week, or month of apathy and inaction by any official in your administration charged with upholding our federal immigration laws and ensuring public safety. Harris is expected to bring up immigration when she visits Mexico and Guatemala next month. A bill banning gender reassignment procedures on children is set for a vote in the Texas House. 
But if lawmakers fail to vote on it by midnight tonight, the bill is dead this session. I wanted to speak with pro-family activist Tracy Shannon about why it's so important for Texas to pass this bill. What she had to say might surprise you. All the institutions in Texas have really come into agreement with gender ideology already, such as schools, therapists, and medical schools, and doctors. So there's no protection for those parents who don't want to transition their children. And also, this is just medical predation on confused children anyway. No doctor and no adult, no parent should be able to make the decision to the child to do something to them that will leave them sterilized for life and disfigured for life. Now, as I understand it, your husband transitioned. How has gender transitioning affected your life personally? Well, um, the whole ideology has affected institutions like the courts. For example, when my husband transitioned, not only did our family break up, which is devastating to children, you know, and to those who go through a divorce, but my kids had to be subjected to the to uh, therapy, which was ordered by the courts, where they weren't getting counseling for the grief that they were going through or the trauma, but they were coached to you know not use pronouns that affirm um, his biological sex. Instead, they were they were punished if they misjudged a pronoun. And they were told not to call their father dad anymore in therapy. And so rather than work on making them feel better, they were coached to uh, do and say things to affirm a lie and make their dad feel better. And ultimately, my children, all, all three of my older children who are from that marriage, um, experienced suicidal ideation. And one the clock is likely to run out for this House bill, but there are Senate bills that still have more time. Those involve only allowing kids to be on sports teams associated with their biological sex and labeling it child abuse if parents give their kids drugs or surgery to change their gender. The U.S. Secret Service is going after fraudsters who want a piece of pandemic relief funds. On Wednesday, the agency reported it has recovered $2 billion taken from relief programs through fraud. The Secret Service director says the fraud cases have also led to more than 120 arrests. The cases involve people hoping to defraud unemployment insurance benefits, specifically the Economic Injury Disaster Loan and the Paycheck Protection Program. The agency says it has opened more than 1,000 investigations that are now looking into fraudulent claims. The Pentagon says the U.S. supports Israel's right to defend itself during its conflict with Hamas. Trump and Pompeo criticized Biden for the attacks, saying his weakness led to Hamas attacking the country. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on Wednesday stressed the U.S.'s support for Israel's right to defend itself against the terrorist group Hamas. A spokesman said Austin spoke with the Israeli Minister of Defense Benny Gantz Wednesday. Austin strongly condemned the rocket attacks by Hamas and Islamic jihadist terrorists on Israeli citizens, and he called for all parties to take steps to restore calm. The brigade commander for Gaza City was one of the Islamic militant group members killed in Israel's retaliatory airstrikes. Biden faced criticism from the former Trump administration. Former President Trump said Biden's weakness and signaling led to the terrorist attacks by Hamas. Trump said, under Biden, the world is getting more violent and more unstable because Biden's weakness and lack of support for Israel is leading to new attacks on our allies. The death toll reportedly rose to at least 40 people as of early Wednesday. 35 of those are Palestinians and five are Israelis. Trump said, unbelievable, Democrats also continue to stand by crazed anti-American representative Ilhan Omar and others who savagely attack Israel while they are under terrorist assault. The White House said Biden's support for Israel will never waver. And with rising tensions in the Middle East, New Yorkers got together to talk about their take on the conflict. NTD's Arian Pasdar has the story. We are here at Times Square today where people from various different countries gathered to show support for Israel. We talked to a few of them. Check out the interviews. Since Monday, 1,500 rockets have been fired from Gaza into Israel. See all these red things? These are all locations where missiles were shot at civilians. Do you see that? Now imagine in America, you guys had these missiles landing in Miami Beach, Florida. Israel has an obligation to defend itself. 
The organizer of the pro-Israel rally is not Jewish or Israeli herself. She told us about a pro-Palestine demonstration in the city the day before. And their sign said, that's to Israel and that's to America. She says safety for Israel means more safety for the US. Some blame Israel for killing civilians in Gaza. But Israelis say Gaza terrorists purposely fire missiles from places like schools and hospitals in the hope Israel won't fire back. We spoke with an active member in the Israeli army. She had arrived in the U.S. just two days before. We tell them, we tell them I'm sorry, to evacuate from there and to go to other places because we don't want other civilians to get hurt. And there was also a counter-protest from a group of conservative Jews. We had money sometimes, there was gold maids of Jews. We could have built a state somewhere, yet we never did that because it's forbidden for us. They say they oppose the state of Israel on religious grounds. Erin Pastar, NTD News, New York. Coming up, law enforcement catches the man who shot three people in Times Square. They find him many miles and states away in a McDonald's parking lot. And a father-son farming team are optimistic about 2021. Their fields are full of crops, but not the corn or soy we'd normally expect. More in just a moment on NTD News. Kids will be kids, which just goes to say kids will be curious. They get into everything, everything. If there's a loaded firearm in the house, they could get their hands on that too. Keeping firearms locked, unloaded, and stored separately from ammunition in a place inaccessible to kids can help keep your loved ones safe from family fire. Safe gun storage saves lives. We're becoming more and more urban. We lose our connection with nature. This little girl lives in a world of natural beauty. Nature all around her. Not everybody has this opportunity. Things are growing all around her all sort of handmade things. The artist has portrayed a scene that is so comforting and so grounded that uh, we can experience this ourselves. The artist himself has to be absolutely natural. And it's not easy to do because children are hard to paint. Birds are hard to paint. They don't sit still. This is quite an accomplishment, reflecting nature back to us. It's just a pure, natural painting. An alleged gunman is now in Florida police custody. He's suspected of shooting three people, including a four-year-old girl, in New York City's Times Square last weekend. Law enforcement found him in a McDonald's parking lot. While there is no joy today, there is justice. Several hours ago in Florida, and Chief Essek will detail the details, the shooter in the incident was apprehended and will be eventually returned to face justice in New York City. He was found in a city outside of Jacksonville. Police say he was trying to shoot his brother in New York when he instead shot three innocent people. All victims are expected to survive. Among them, a 23-year-old tourist from Rhode Island who was shot in the leg, a 43-year-old New Jersey resident who was shot in the foot, and a four-year-old girl who was shot in the leg. All victims were female. It's planting season for corn and soybeans again. A father-son team in Wisconsin is working around the clock on their, 100, on their 1,100 acres of land. They say they feel positive about 2021 and that they're taking on a natural approach. The Pyrick family farm's fields are full of crops. 
But the crops are not corn nor soy, and they are not going to harvest it. We are uh, currently planting corn in our uh, rye cover crop. Josh and his father Tony started using cover crops years ago to improve the health of their soil. Right now, the rye cover crops act like placeholders for the actual harvest. The main benefit we've noticed with the cover crops is uh, weed suppression. It's been able to reduce our herbicide use on beans to help control the weeds. The Pyrex tell NTD they are optimistic about this year's corn and soy harvest. On top of that, futures for corn and soy on the NASDAQ are approaching record highs since mid-2012. Oh, it's an exciting time in agriculture now. These cover crops are fun. You see the green fields out there, you see the living roots out there, and, and it's just amazing. And seeing your biology come back to life and seeing the earthworms come back. Over 150,000 farms across the country have found benefits in using cover crops. The Pyrex have reduced fertilizer and no longer need to treat seeds with chemicals. They also no longer till the ground. In a teaspoon of soil, there's more living organisms than there is people on Earth. When you go under a microscope and start seeing that and see what live soil looks like in the biology, it's like building a house. Okay, you build a house. Would you tear it down every year and rebuild it every year? Tony grew up farming with his father in the 70s. Josh joined him in carrying on the tradition after returning from college. So already going on 14 years already, 15 years already, hey. <laughs> and he will carry on these conservation practices for many years to come. A new survey says credit card debt may be a bigger problem for college students in the future. AIG Retirement Services and Everfi released the study Wednesday. Researchers surveyed over 20,000 college students nationwide. They found more have credit cards than a year ago with 53% charging two or more credit cards, up from 41% a year ago. 40% said they have more than $1,000 in credit card debt, and 14% have more than $5,000. Almost two out of five students do not expect to pay their entire credit card bill each month. That means they'll have to pay interest. Researchers say the increased reliance on credit cards has the potential for future financial trouble. Practitioners of a spiritual meditation system are marching through the streets of Manhattan today. They're celebrating World Fallen Dafa Day, the anniversary of when the practice was first taught publicly. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more from 42nd Street. So we're here in New York City, and to the side of me is the World Fallen Dafa Day Parade. So it's been 29 years since the practice of Falun Dafa was introduced to the public. And they actually couldn't hold this parade last year due to COVID restrictions. This year, now that things are opening up, it's great to see that things are, come, are starting to return back to the way they were. Now, we're still in a pandemic, and there are many stories about how this practice that focuses on truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance and also has uh, exercises has helped people get through these difficult times. And how long have you been practicing for? I've been practicing Dafa since 2000, the year. Wow, it's quite a long time. And how has the practice benefited you? Uh, so from the very beginning, uh, I stopped drinking, stopped smoking, my temperament changed. Uh, my family has noticed a significant change in me and thus have um, likewise received this, uh, a lot of the benefits as well, he health benefits, uh, character benefits, etc. I've also become a better person in society, at my job, better husband. What about during this pandemic? So we just went through some really heavy lockdowns, especially in some areas like New York. How did the practice help you during the lockdowns? Well, you know, being so deep in meditation it helps you remain calm, keep clear-headed, keep focused. And uh, with the grueling hours of working from home, uh, it allowed me to balance out, um, not really be impacted too much uh, uh, by, the, by the lockdown, and also be more uh, sympathetic and empathic to everyone who's going through the challenges right now. We're in a pandemic right now. A lot of places have gone through really bad lockdowns. Uh, I don't know what situations you've been through, but how has it helped you through any of these lockdowns? Well, it was wonderful to keep calm, and I did some, get a little bit of anxiety at first, so meditation helped me to just remain calm and find the rational approach to things and find my compassionate spot. I think I've been practicing for um, since I was five, so like 15, almost 14 years, I think. Mm -hmm. How has the practice helped you during the lockdowns? Um, to be honest, I was having a lot of uh, mental pressure and anxiety of not knowing where to go with my life. 
So I really thought what helped me was doing the morning meditation. Could really help me find a sense of peace within myself as external things like you know going shopping or going out with friends no longer kind of helped me because you know it was a temporary release but afterwards I still feel kind of pretty anxious about myself. So I, could, I was able to read some of the Falun Dafa books, the Zhuan Falun and other lectures and they really helped me to um, kind of think about what I really want to go to be doing in my life, my direction in life. So it was a period of condensement for myself. I was able to reflect on my future and yes. Um, I think it really made me um, a really um, accepting and compassionate person um, in terms of the ups and downs in life because I know they all happen for a reason and the way I want to be facing is not to reject everything that comes my way and to kind of create conflicts with people in my situation but to really accept them and to view it with a you know positive attitude and to keep going in life I think that's what helps. Oh, I've been practicing Falun Dafa for um, about 17 years. Non okay. Yep, I never stopped. I love it. And what got you into the practice? My friend introduced it to me. I was studying at the time and I was looking for um, something to give me more meaning in my life and um, I also was struggling with some depression and not feeling very good really and I needed something and um, the meditation was beautiful so I, I, I got into it pretty quickly and I found it was, it was, it was um, solving my health problems and, and really gave me a lot of peace of mind and a lot of hope and made me a much better person so I've never stopped practicing. So we're in a pandemic right now, how has the practice helped you during the lockdowns? Oh my gosh, I think Falun Dafa has helped me so much during the pandemic. I feel really fortunate. Um, it gave me a lot of confidence in my own health. I, I don't have any fear that I would get sick, or at least I wouldn't get very sick. I might maybe get a runny nose, but I just have no fear. It's a very strong mental state of mind for a start. Um, and then the other thing I think is having a meditation practice and something very introspective, something that you can you can uh, be guided to have a bigger picture of life and, and the whole world, it allows you to step back and look at what's happening, uh, at, at things in a different way. And it gives me, it definitely gives me a lot more confidence um, to be to be calm and peaceful even in really hard times. But as positive as these stories are it's actually very difficult for Falun Gong practitioners to practice this in China where the practice began and this is because for 20 years now over 20 years they've been persecuted by the Chinese regime so they are being wrongly imprisoned tortured they're being killed simply because they want to practice something that focuses on truthfulness compassion and forbearance so politicians from different states Democrats and Republicans have sent their greetings to Falun Gong practitioners uh, for this day and they've also condemned what the Chinese regime is doing while at the same time commending the practices principles that it's free to learn and how it's helped people in their communities. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. And just ahead, once the biggest department store in the UK, Debenhams, will close all of its retail stores this week. The retailer has been on the high street for 242 years. Stay tuned to find out more. An end of an era for Debenhams. Once the biggest department store in the UK, the chain will, the chain will close all of its high street stores for the last time this week. Here's NTD's Jane Whirl with more. Debenham's time on the high street is coming to an end after 242 years. All of its stores will shut this week. Fashion retailer Boohoo bought Debenham's for £55 million in January. It bought the brand, but not the shops. It meant 118 remaining Debenham stores and its workers had to go. The closure of Debenham's physical stores, including this flagship store in London, means that 12,000 people will lose their jobs. Pandemic shutdowns proved too much for the already struggling retailer. Debenhams has been a weak business for many, many years. The clock has been ticking for uh, an awful long time. Meanwhile, some other department stores have done much better, have invested more in 
the infrastructure of their businesses, in the shopping experience, in the quality of the product, and they have uh, fared better, albeit still had to face a hit from the pandemic. In a similar shift, online retailer ASOS bought the Topshop and Miss Selfridge brands in February, but didn't want their physical stores. A sense of sadness on the street, but a feeling that it was inevitable. I think it's quite sad. It's quite sort of, at the moment, everything's very empty and desolate. Um, I think it'll be an opportunity to maybe look at um, retail uh, buildings and offices and stuff and, and change the way we live. I think it's a shame, but um, I think the pandemic has just accelerated what was happening anyway, that people's shopping habits are uh, becoming more convenient to the individual rather than convenient to the shop owner. And, uh, and, and things have to move in that direction. And if you lag behind and hope things are going to move backwards, you're going to lose out. It didn't really affect me too much because I wasn't really the person that would go to Debenhams. I wasn't really the person experiencing the Debenhams experience, saying that way. But I think that being so present in so many high streets, I think it affected everyone. While Debenhams will disappear from the high street, it will still continue online. But town planners will be wondering what's next for the empty stores. Jane Warrell, NTD News, London. The Paris Zoological Park is preparing to welcome visitors for the first time in months. It's been closed since October, and the animals there have spent months interacting solely with their zookeepers. The zoo is scheduled to reopen on May 19th, with limits on visitor numbers. Zookeepers have already carved out pathways to ensure social distancing. The reopening marks the end of the zoo's second lockdown. The first ended in June 2020. By then, 62 new babies had been born amid the closed doors. A baby tapir was born last November. Its first birth, it was the first birth for the species in the zoo since 1987. Other new residents include baboons, Humboldt, penguins, and flamingos. The reopening comes as France slowly unwinds from its third national lockdown. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan. have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.